Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, Stuart Gill. I'm the Master Head of College at uh, Queen's College, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. In a few minutes, I'm going to ask one of our uh, students to, uh, to uh, bring an acknowledgement of country. Um, but in welcoming you, I'd just like to acknowledge a few people in the room. It's terrific to have the uh, Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Duncan Masco, here with us. Uh, he was here a few weeks ago to help us uh, relaunch uh, the Sugden Institute, under whose auspices we uh, sort of are starting to run uh, all of these events. And uh, also the, uh, the president of our council, uh, Dr. Ian Marshman, and uh, also our principal fellow, uh, Professor David Vaux, uh, that's with us this evening. Uh, everyone's a special guest. We've got uh, visitors from the uh, university, from the business world, uh, from the wider uh, community. Uh, we have uh, a number of apologies uh, this evening. Um, Unfortunately, the plague has caught up with uh, a number of people, and uh, I think uh, today we had about a dozen uh, apologies uh, come through from a former governor general uh, all the way down to um, uh, school teachers. Um, uh, 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 the school teachers are actually far more important these days than governor generals. Um, I, I, spent, I spent the afternoon with uh, uh, a, a wyvern who uh, used to be principal for major school, uh, state school in country Victoria, and he was uh, he was a maths teacher and uh, did did maths and uh, psychology at uh, the University of Melbourne. And I said we need uh, you know more people like yourself uh, involved in education, but um, we're here tonight, of course, to hear from our special guest Sean, but. Uh, before uh, we do that, I would like to invite uh, one of our uh, students and part of the Indigenous community uh, here at Queen's Hamish Rose to uh, deliver a graduate country. Hamish, thank you. Uh, thanks, Stuart. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which Queens is situated, that being the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. Um, I pay my respects to their elders past and present, along with those that may be em emerging. Um, I'd also like to extend those respects to Professor Sean Yudewin, um, who is here tonight, along with any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here with us tonight. Um, I acknowledge that the land, water and skies, along with the sovereignty of Indigenous Australians, uh, was not ceded and that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you. Um, thanks. Thanks very much, Hamish. It's... it's, uh, it's I, um, very important that all of our functions here at Queen's that we uh, acknowledge uh, the traditional uh, owners and custodians of the, the land. And uh, we have for a number of years been building uh, a community uh, here. I think the first Indigenous student uh, was probably Sean Mowat, um, uh, certainly the first Indigenous master's uh, student uh, to come to Queen's was in 2011. And since about 2005, we've had close to 50 um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students and residents, uh, the majority really being in the, in the last five years. And uh, we have a number of people supporting um, our students here, um, including um, a number of corporates like uh, our Deloitte uh, Indigenous uh, Scholarship. And we're very grateful for that, that support. Um, Professor Sean Ewing, that I'm going to introduce tonight, follows in a small list of Indigenous orators that we've had here at Queen's. The first was in 2017, uh, Professor Marcia Langton, who I'm sure is very well known to you, uh, followed by, in 2018, Professor John Burroughs, uh, the Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Law at the University of Victoria in, in Canada. 
And in 2019, uh, at Sean's uh, 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 referral, uh, Professor Suzanne Kudama, Professor and Associate Dean Maori at the University of Otago. Um, in 2020, we shifted a little bit and we had uh, Dean Parkin, who's been heading up the campaign uh, from the heart, and we've heard a lot from uh, recently as we move into the election period. Sean was supposed to be our orator in 2021, uh, but we decided that we would uh, skip that year uh, because it would have been online and we thought it would be much better to, uh, to have Sean in person. Of course, in the meantime, he decided to move universities as well. And um, so he has travelled uh, south uh, from Griffith uh, to be with us, uh, Griffith uh, University in Brisbane to be with us this evening. Uh, prior uh, to joining Griffith, he, uh, Sean uh, was the Pro Vice Chancellor, Place and Indigenous, and Foundation Director of the Melbourne Post Centre for Indigenous Health in the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences uh, here at the University of Melbourne. In 2020, he spent a year as the Professor of Indigenous Health and Leadership in the School of Global Affairs at King's College London. Um, Sean is currently the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Education, so with a remit uh, across uh, Griffith University to uh, look at uh, uh, wider issues of uh, teaching and learning uh, within the university. Um, Sean has been a good friend of mine, I think, since I came to Queen's, and we were involved in an international project in peace and reconciliation, justice and reconciliation, through the Association of Commonwealth Universities, which uh, Sean uh, also chaired for a number of years. Sean is passionate about the importance of diversity and inclusion uh, as a precondition for excellence in higher education. And I'm reminded of what uh, another uh, Canadian uh, First Nations legal scholar and uh, judge and senator um, had to say about this area, that our problems came with education and they will go with education. And it's in that international context that I want us to think this evening because we've, uh, the aim of these uh, orations is not solely to um, think about Australia, but we're in a much wider global context as well. And that's why we've, in the past, we've had John Burroughs and Suzanne Putama. With his wide experience and international experience that uh, Sean brings to the question of the importance of place and the role for recon uh, the, the, the move from reconciliation to solidarity, I think we're in safe hands this evening. We look forward to what you're going to share with us. Please welcome Professor Sean Dewey. Thanks, Stuart. Um, my niece also came to Queen's and was here up until halfway through the pandemic, but she's still in Melbourne, but clearly had something better to do tonight. Um, but I'm delighted that my sister could uh, uh, make the journey from Kensington. Um, Hamish, thank you for the warm uh, welcome uh, acknowledgement of country. Uh, and Stuart, thank you for your warm welcome. It's nice to be back and nice to see a bunch of familiar and mostly friendly faces. Uh, and for those of you that I haven't met, thank you for coming out tonight uh, as well. Given the topic of the oration, there's a particular salience uh, and sometimes tokenism to reflecting about our approach to the practice of acknowledgement of country, but I really appreciated the gravity with which you did that uh, tonight uh, as a signifier of this evening, Hamish. I'll tell a few stories, some of which you may have heard before, and I hope to connect them and to land in a bit of a different place through this oration. Uh, to be really clear, the thoughts remain a work in progress. Let's start in 1844 with the evocative text from the university's excellent historian, James Waghorn. In an extract from the University of Melbourne website and drawing on references from Westgarth himself, James writes, 
In 1844, nine years before the University of Melbourne was established, the merchant and politician William Westgarth found himself lost in the scrub north of Melbourne while riding home late one night. Drawn to the light of campfires that were burning a along a creek, he encountered a group of Wurundjeri people, one of whom was clearly sick from the disease brought by the colonizers. For Westgarth, it was a memorable, if comfortless scene, but one with a greater meaning. He located the camp at the heart of what would later become the University of Melbourne, close to where its first major building, the Quadrangle, would be built. With the building of the Quad and the establishment of the university, Westgarth claimed that this showed the dramatic change brought about by the university, the height of civilization, um, as it brought enlightenment to the primitive colony. He missed the irony, as Waghorn writes, uh, he missed the irony that on this occasion it was the Wurundjeri people who provided the light and who obligingly pointed the hapless Westgarth, Westgarth down the hill towards his home. Waghorn goes on to state that the university was an undeniable agent of colonisation and dispossession and of the imposition of European ideals onto an Australian setting. The history of the university and the associated colleges like Queen's should be well known to this audience and the master may well like to, to elaborate in question time. I won't dive deeper into the history now, but we shall return later this evening to consider this event of Westgarth through the conceptualization of shared place and solidarity. Many of you won't know I have spent a lot of time undertaking two doctoral degrees. I finished one in education at the University of Melbourne, but this was preceded by a decade long attempt at one in philosophy, which I didn't complete. Many of my thoughts tonight draw upon what I've learnt and the experiences of my postgraduate work, my Master's in International Studies and my incomplete Doctorate in Philosophy, both of which were focused on post-apartheid South Africa. One of the great gifts of being a physiotherapist trained in Australia was the profession's mobility and ability to get locum work around the world, well, I think, although I think I pushed that a little further than most. In 1994, I was visiting friends in Michigan, closely watching the lead up to the South African election on CNN. There was a real and present fear of violence, the long and winding queues as people lined up to vote, many for the first time in their long lives, and then the result of the 26th of April. I flew back to London, then down to Johannesburg. I like to travel. Therefore, it should come as no surprise that one of the great memories of my life was landing in Johannesburg's Jan Smuts Airport in 1994. The airport is now called the O.R. Tambo Airport. Field Marshal Jan Schmutz was twice Prime Minister of South Africa. Oliver Tambo, who the airport is now named after, was president in exile of, this, of the uh, African National Congress, the ANC. And with Mandela and Walter Sisulu, they established the ANC Youth League in 1944. As an aside, uh, Tullamarine Airport, which I flew into this afternoon, was named either after the suburb of Tullamarine or directly after the person whom the su suburb Tullamarine was named after. Tullamarina uh, is the name, and the name has a provenance. He was a senior Wurundjeri man who we believe was present at the signing of the Batman Treaty at Mary Creek. He also burnt down the first Melbourne jail to escape. He was jailed for stealing potatoes to, steal his, to feed his family. Anyway, enough of the airport names. Arriving at Jan Smuts Airport following the overnight flight from London, peering out of the window, I observed the runways and taxi taxiways were filled with aircraft parked from all around the world. The, <coughs> excuse me, the perimeter of the airport was lined with the South African Defence Force personnel replete with big guns. We were all rushing to witness the inauguration of South Africa's first democratically elected president, Nelson Mandela. I watched the inauguration from a living room in a primarily white and Jewish Johannesburg suburb. I heard and watched the planes roar overhead as the inauguration took place some 50 kilometers away at the Union buildings in Pretoria. It was brilliant. Dignitaries present at the Union buildings were a dime a dozen, including a 2017 awardee of an honorary doctorate from the University of Melbourne, Vice President Al Gore, First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton, Cuban President Fidel Castro, the wonderful South African singer Miriam Makeba, Bob Hawke, Malcolm Fraser, and heads of state from around 160 other countries. 
A few weeks later, I had the opportunity to visit the union buildings in Pretoria, clamber all around it, sit where the dignitaries sat, have my photo taken by a friend in a time before iPhones and selfies, with a black power salute near where Mandela had been just a few weeks earlier. Over the next few years, I undertook a Master of International Studies and researched the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. <laughs> my master's thesis was prosaically titled, To what extent has South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission achieved its aims of promoting national unity and reconciliation? Oh, the naivety of youth. To be clear, submitting towards the end of 1998, just as the Commission completed its mandated work, was a little optimistic to be answer the, answer the question I had set for myself. Indeed, tonight's oration, some quarter of a century later, remains a revisiting and reflection of that question. Nevertheless, as a visiting researcher at the University of the Witwatersrand in the bowels of their law library, finding paper journals and a pricey photocopier dial-up network, I surrounded myself with discussions of conflict, reconciliation, truth, forgiveness, crimes against humanity, and national unity. In between times, I would visit the Kruger National Park, Cape Town and Durban, and watch Shane Warne torment Daryl Cullinan at the Wanderers Stadium in Johannesburg. So it was an exciting time in my life. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission was established as a mechanism for South Africa to deal with its legacy of apartheid and engage with what they called transitional justice, transitioning from apartheid to the rainbow nation and democratic governance. There were some key emergent themes of my research in South Africa on the Truth Commission, which for me, as I mentioned, remained somewhat unresolved and contested a quarter of a century later. Archbishop Tutu was appointed the chairman of the Truth Commission, and I think his role and influence is nicely captured in the following quote. If the grave and plodding Mandela is our reliable father, then that hyperactive little figure in ermine at his side is our naughty uncle the one who carries all the family's emotional baggage, weeping for us when we grieve, dancing when we celebrate. Ready for retirement, he neither sought nor wanted the chairmanship of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. What better man, though, to lead in the drama of truth and reconciliation, manifest manifesting externally all the emotions of restitution and contrition, an ultimate catharsis that we, black and white alike, are expected to feel. The quote also captures the aspirations of the time, indeed the expectations of what the Commission would deliver, restitution, contrition and catharsis. The Commission captured the daily news cycle for more than three years. There was a daily TV program update on the often dramatic happenings and the associated politics and activity which surrounded the tra transition for the New South Africa. The depths of depravity made for some pretty horrendous stuff and all duly reported on the 5.30 must-watch TV program on SABC One. I found it last night on the internet. It was called Truth Commission Special Report. Over the course of the Commission, key and contested themes and ideas emerged and were and still are discussed. The premise of the Commission, at its most basic, was that the truth would set you free. The truth would help reconcile a divided nation the relationship between truth and reconciliation was explicit. It was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There was always, however, an ongoing niggle and discomfort about the intractable need to engage with forgiveness or its absence and its apparent centrality for South Africa's future. Victims shared many of their stories. There were over 20,000 written submissions from victims and about 2,000 of these were heard in the public forum. The telling and, listening of, uh, telling and listening of and from the victims was prioritised uh, and the Commission led with these hearings. What then followed was the amnesty provision, the grinding of amnesty for perpetrators of apartheid-related crime. I won't go into all the fine detail about the amnesty provision. There were guidelines and specific requirements, but in short, you could apply for amnesty for, for crimes committed in the course of upholding or attempting to pull down the apartheid regime and you would be granted amnesty in return for telling the full truth about what you did. My recollection was that whilst the amnesty provision itself was contested and debated, there was wide consensus, including from the interviews that I undertook, that because of the offer of amnesty in return for truth, more was known about the apartheid regime than would otherwise have been found out. 
but it did bring into stark relief some challenging ideas and consequences. As I mentioned, what was required at the Commission in exchange for amnesty was the truth. There was no requirement for contrition or remorse, real or confected. As one amnesty applicant said about the high profile of uh, murder of Chris Harney, gunned down in his driveway in Easter 1993, it is unfortunately so that during every war, there are casualties. The applicants for amnesty for Harney's murder weren't successful, but not because they weren't contrite. It's because they couldn't make the link that they were acting under direct orders of the Conservative Party. And a lack of contrition makes, in many cases, forgiveness more difficult. As Tutu said to me in an interview I had with him in 1998 as part of my research, forgiveness is not easy. Reconciliation is not easy. I think this is an important and difficult conundrum. Is forgiveness a precondition for reconciliation? How do societies with complex and conflicted pasts craft a shared future together? I don't know if there are answers to these questions, perhaps just each person's experiences. For a deeply divided post-apartheid society, reconciliation was the primary narrative and the relationship between reconciliation, forgiveness and contrition was a strong one. The ceremony and ritual, if you like, of the TRC, led by Tutu, reinforced these ideas based in a religiosity. A couple of quotes which illustrate the culture of the commission that Tutu, Tutu nurtured. They go. The commission opened with a causa hymn and Tutu lighting a tall white candle which will burn throughout the hearings in remembrance of those who died and disappeared. Another quote. He, Tutu, has certainly stamped the commission with his particular style. The preachiness and the churchiness and the sort of pageant-like quality of the hearings, which were very much part of Tutu's own style. Intensely irritating at first, but I think that's become increasingly functional to the way it operates. Reconciliation may or may not require forgiveness. Indeed, contrition may, in some cases, not be possible due to the passage of time. But reconciliation appears a lot harder without them. What I was left feeling about the reconciliation process in South Africa during the mid to late 1990s was that until there was economic justice or economic reconciliation, there wouldn't or couldn't be a more meaningful reconciliation, and that we were in the domain of performative processes rather than a transformative process. And in South Africa, like most places I think, land, place, remain central to economic justice and economic reconciliation in the form of housing and jobs and a shared sense of community. I was back in South Africa 21 years after Mandela's inauguration, and my travelling companion who hadn't been to South Africa before, but with a keen eye for the social context, made the unsolicited remark as we made our way through the Kruger Park, it looks like all the white people are on holiday and all the black people are working. And so we move on to a brunch in London, just off Oxford Street near Tottenham Court Road Underground Station. It was early 2020 and before we started to feel the day-to-day -day impact of the pandemic on our lives around the world. I was meeting with Professor Pumla Godobo Madikazela. Professor Godobo Madikazela was passing through London from Queen's University Belfast. The university provides a hint about her research project. And she was heading back to Stellenbosch where she was a professor of historical memory and trauma. I was unaware of her in the 1990s, but she was one of the Truth Commissioners, commissioners in the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Pumla and I were talking about the role of forgiveness in reconciliation and whether crimes against humanity are forgivable, palatable brunch conversation. We canvassed Hannah Arendt's approach to this such that men are not capable of forgiving what they cannot punish, nor of punishing the unforgivable. When Pumla said to me that she had moved on from the centrality of forgiveness as a construct to which to think about dealing with the past. Perhaps more accurately, she was thinking about the future. She started talking about solidarity as a construct that she was unpacking. Her experience in South Africa and the Truth Commission and its utility in a place like Northern Ireland. Her views are best captured, as I understand them, through a conversation she had available online 
with University College London. She said, and she's talking about her time in the mid-1990s as, as a commissioner, here was a moment when we were reflecting on how do we live together, and this is very, very important, and a lot of people miss this. How do we live together despite what has happened? And so the language of forgiveness and forgiving <clears throat> emerged from that conversation, and that's why I, she, Pumla, began writing her work as a challenge to the scholarship of the impossibility of forgiveness, was our brunch conversation. She goes on, which is what it was kind of the standard perception of the time, and there were very clear examples of forgiveness. My position at the time was very much celebratory about this language, about these moments. Over the 10 year period when I started turning, I started revising my thinking about this. I began to see that this language is very limited. The language, the syntax, or syntax of forgiveness is the wrong words to use in this context. I pause here from Pumla's text and reflect on my own thoughts and the vexed and tricky relationship between forgiveness, contrition, and reconciliation. And to link Australia in, Professor Godobo Madikazela is talking about her time as a commissioner in the late uh, 1990s. And remember, Australia introduced the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation in 1991, and it's been a part of our lexicon ever since. She goes on, what is important for us to understand is perhaps to theorize less about forgiveness, but rather about the possibility of the coming together of people from different sides of history. In other words, the possibility that we might be able to build a sense of solidarity despite our past. And I've come to understand that this is actually, that this actually is important for us because forgiveness turns people off. And in fact, sometimes people say forgive when it means different things. And when the word is used often from the perspective of those who were perpetrators or those who benefited from the past, it's really to mean Let's forget the past, let's move on, and let's just forget the past. The Truth Commission, in my view, had forgiveness as a central element of its, worth, of its work on a pathway towards reconciliation. But that Pumla, in her revisiting of the TRC testimony, began considering reparative humanism as perhaps a more useful concept in place of forgiveness and the future-looking notion of solidarity. She argues that reparative humanism is a better way to think about the encounters between perpetrator and victim. It is in fact, an, and upon reflection, a message not too far from Tutu's language he often used. I provide another quote from Tutu, which is graphic, but it strongly makes the point about Tutu's approach. He saw the potential of himself in the other. The quote goes, when you hear where the police officers who gave him drugged coffee and shot him in the head and burnt his body, but while his body is burning on one side of the road, on this side they're having a barbecue. I found that, Tutu says, I found that for me to be one of the most devastating things that could be said about us human beings. Tutu identifies with the humanism, depraved as it is, as it is in this example, through the words, one of the most devastating things that could be said about us human beings. Solidarity through reparative humanism seems at first consideration a bit of a contradiction, deeply divided societies and solidarity. And as I alluded to, Queen's Belfast provided Pumla with academic colleagues pondering the same issues of deeply divided societies and their place-based case being the troubles in Northern Ireland. Nearly a quarter of a century since I'd interviewed Archbishop Tutu, solidarity was new to me uh, but as a concept, I think provided ways to revisit some of the challenges and rabbit holes down which reconciliation might take us. Further, in perhaps a more pragmatic way, solidarity might also ground us to place. Let me repeat Pumla's hope. The possibility that we might be able to build a sense of solidarity despite our past. She comes at this as a professor of historical memory and trauma with a disciplinary background in psychology. So she has a particular way to, to get to that point. Place, in its very simplest framing, provides a context, a shared environment, holds a history, and can provide for economic prosperity for the peoples that inhabit and share a place. It has layers of history, like layers of sedimentary rock. Some of those layers might represent the glory days, other layers represent darker times of conflict. But it is on those layers, from that height and perspective, and cognizant of those layers, 
that we might need to think about how we continue to inhabit that place together into the future. I want to segue now to, uh, to the most recent Queen's Indigenous oration, uh, and Stuart mentioned this, an application of these concepts of reparative humanism, solidarity and place to the Uluru Statement from the Heart. As Stuart said, the most recent Queen's Indigenous oration was in 2020, delivered by Dean Parkin. Dean talked about the Uluru Statement from the Heart and what it offered and some of the possible ways forward and their associated challenges. Dean bravely delivered the oration online, something I wasn't prepared to do last year. A seminal paragraph from the Uluru Statement, and I think you can hear Noel Pearson's prose here, follows and makes the link to people and place. It outlines the genesis of sovereignty for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and it says, this sovereignty is a spiritual notion. The ancestral tie between the land or Mother Earth and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil, or better, of sovereignty. As Hamish reminded us, it has never been ceded or extinguished, and it coexists with the sovereignty of the Crown. My next steps aren't to prosecute, rewrite, or critique the, critique the Uluru Statement from the heart, but rather see how, my, how we might reflect on the application of reparative humanism and solidarity. The paragraph of the statement I just, I just recited makes the explicit link between Indigenous peoples and the land or place. It articulates what sovereignty means and makes the claim that this sovereignty coexists with the sovereignty of the, of the Crown. It coexists. I'm intrigued by the possibilities of how a narrative of solidarity might inform our understanding of the Uluru Statement and how reparative humanism might support each of us to see the other. I want to investigate the concept of reparative humanism and solidarity in part to think about the Gordian knot, which is that if crimes against humanity can't be proportionally punished or can't be forgiven, are we caught in a place which precludes the possibility of reconciliation? If, if forgiveness is a precondition of reconciliation. But it possibly leaves a place for solidarity in a shared future, as Pumla described, of how we live together. Whilst reconciliation remains the predominant discourse in Australia, both reconciliation and sol solidarity require some indispensable steps, including truth-telling. The Uluru Statement continues, with substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. I contend that this fuller expression of Australian nationhood is a signal to recognise our shared humanity in Australia, and in so doing, the possibility of reparative humanism, perhaps writ large at a national level. I guess I'm an optimist. The Uluru Statement concludes that we invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. Explicit here is the connection of Indigenous Australians as part of the inclusive movement of the Australian people, an inclusive, better future. That's almost a definition of solidarity. I think there is a utility in thinking more deeply about solidarity and the Uluru Statement and our shared future, how we build it, why we build it. I'm not advocating for ignoring the past, but I often wonder how far the framing of the concept of reconciliation has taken us. And by thinking about place, our shared place, our limited resources which emerge from our place, place as a driver of economic independence and empowerment, and that many institutions of colonisation now own much of that place, what steps might we take for reparative humanism on a path to solidarity? So in closing, let's go back to Westgarth in, in 1844, just a few hundred metres from here. From the reports, including his own of the encounter and historical interpretations, Westgarth was pointed in the right direction by the Wurundjeri. Westgarth reflected that the university brought the height of civilization and enlightenment to the primitive colony. But I wonder if even Westgarth for one moment considered at what cost that civilization or enlightenment might have come 
or if there was no discernible cost to him at the time. Our individual responses to a history of conflict and exclusion can and often is different. We often have little choice but to embrace the place on which we live. But perhaps we need to try and see and understand members of our community who might have a stronger or different relationship with some of those historical sedimentary layers of place, which perhaps don't re represent the best of the human condition. Tutu's language and approach to the Wurundjeri that night might have been different and evoked the shared nature of being human. And Godobo Medicazella might urge us to think about the reparative humanism which supports a shared future for people from deeply divided societies. I think one of the central tenets of the Uluru Statement, while stating the grounds for sovereignty for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, also talks about a coexisting sovereignty, a path towards solidarity. As Tutu closed his conversation with me, I quote him to, to close this part of our conversation together tonight. We are wounded, all of us, and we bring a lot of baggage to all sorts of things. And if we are healers at all, we are wounded healers. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sean. And uh, I think we've got a few uh, minutes for uh, questions or comments, if anyone would like to ask a, a question. You stumbled into something. David. I, uh, I really like the idea of uh, using the term solidarity uh, rather than the term Reconciliation, and certainly much, much better that the term tolerance. You know, we used to be told we were a tolerant society, but that just makes my flesh creep because it implies that you know you've got to put up with something. Um, so I, I like the, uh, the, the, the the idea of solidarity being at one, being one together. But of course, you know, there's all these dangers of uh, of language. You know, you think then then I'm saying. One nation, and then I thought, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, another term would be uh, integrity. Integrity means, you know, an integer, it means oneness, it means together. And it has the sense of being, you know, one society, uh, a culture that's, that's, that's not divided. Um, but it also means uh, adhering to uh, 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 you know, a principle and, uh, and, and not, you know, not having exceptions. So, uh, so I just wanted to make a comment there. And I might respond in brief that it's, I think, useful to remember around the language that solidarity in a trade union sense has a particular meaning. The trade unions in South Africa were particularly important and their relationship with the Communist Party uh, was particularly important. So given Pumla uses that word, I'm interested in some of the things that might drive her thinking there as well. Yeah. John, thank you very much for a very, a very thoughtful presentation. Uh, I just wondered whether you would be willing to uh, extend a, a little bit to reflect a little bit on what's happening in Victoria uh, with the uh, with, with the work that's going on there and how that might be you know eventually sort of play out up into a, a, a broad national uh, canvas. Yeah, thanks, Ian. I'm not. Uh... I made the comment that I think truth-telling is indispensable, where what, whatever we choose to name the next point. And so I think the, the Europe Commission is pretty important. I think all commissions, I'm not making a particular comment here, I think all commissions are flawed in some way and that's just their nature and we'll look back at them in 20 years and think, why did we do it that way as we're doing in part to the Truth Commission in South Africa. But I think there's, there's a, an importance of that process where that leads to... Um, who knows, but, and I'm not, again, not being negative, it's like I, I kind of just want to give them space to do their thing without over-commenting, except to make the point that a truth-telling process is but what's been asked for in the, in the Uluru Statement. The Europe Commission is getting on with their work, um, and I'll be really interested to see how that goes. So I'm kind of dodging your question a bit, Ian. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, Sean, thank you. Really enjoyed uh, and, and kind of still processing uh, much of your presentation. Uh, can I draw you back to the gorilla in the room that you that you actually acknowledged, which was socioeconomic disadvantage? Um, and um, where does uh, how do you sequence the addressing of socioeconomic disadvantage with uh, the more um, sort of emotional um, elements of solidarity and, and reconciliation that you've been talking about? I mean. Surely the second part of that cannot proceed without the first part being seriously addressed. And I'm just well aware of the, of, of the dreadful kind of closing gap uh, statistics that still remind us that we're making zero progress on, on, that, on that front. One of the things that uh, Professor Godobe Medicazella talks about is the intergenerational trauma and how that's coming back and coming back and coming back. And I think one way to address your question is to think about um, intergenerational, how we start to build up intergenerational success. Now, it wasn't a flippant comment about all the whites are on holidays and all the blacks are working, and it's only 21 years in some sense. My response would probably be more positive in terms of what we're all engaged with in terms of education and seeing there are really good numbers of Indigenous kids going to school, succeeding, going to university, succeeding. Uh, and I think I'd be starting to want to think about that in an intergenerational sense. Um, I get that the closing the gap data is, mm, maybe it's provocative, maybe it's trite, maybe it's not the right data, um, but how do we probably in the work that we all do think about the transformative nature of education and think about that in an intergenerational way? Okay. Uh, Sean, thank you. That was excellent. Just to pick up about the Royal Commission. You mentioned that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa um, was broadcast by 30 every evening on SABC. Um, I'll bet if I walk down the street and ask people in Victoria what the Royal Commission was, most of them would not know. Um, how will that commission and the results, and not the results, but the findings, the outcomes of that commission, gain traction mm. um, among our broader Victorian community or Australian community, which is over the world in the central part of the success of you. Yeah, I, I'll probably partly take that as a reflection, Ken. Uh, gaining traction, gaining legitimacy, um, something it was, <laughs> I was reading on the plane on the way down, um, it was kind of a typo, but the Commission are saying they're off for the next round of hearings at the Charcoal Lane um, and their public hearings, but because of COVID, no, none of the public can come, <laughs> but you can watch it online. Um, it's, it's, what, 26 years, 25 years since the Com Truth Commission. I talked about dial-up internet, and I can still hear that squeaky noise on the phone as, you know, you paid a lot of money. Um, I think they're probably going to have to use a bunch of social media. I reckon there's, I reckon there's a generation, a, a, a generation that's, not over, that's, that's underrepresented in this room you guys perhaps accepted. Um, how do we think about the youth that are going to engage in the commission and how do we think about that and how do we perhaps get the stories, again, whether it's into the schools, um, early years of uni and so on. Uh, it's going to be a challenge. And yeah, the South African Commission, look, you also had the leadership. You had Mandela, you had Tutu. It was a pageant. Um, it was an important pageant, but it was a pageant. Um, and that just gained, in many ways, the world's attention and their attention. Um, and I'm not making a personal comparison with anybody here, but the charismatic leadership is an interesting thing that, that uh, you probably have to treasure it when it's here, because when it's gone, there's not someone immediately to replace Mandela or Tutu or whomever else. So, yeah. Um, sure, it was also a different history. Um, and, and I think that's important as well, which is South Africa and Australia and the kind of trauma that they went through, the trauma that we got through. There's that, there, there are similarities that intergenerational trauma, mm. but there, there are also historical differences as well. There was one article though, but to come back to that point, there was, a, yes, there were differences. There was one um, 
article that I was reading last night that this young fellow was, I think, five when his dad was killed in the apartheid regime. And he watched his mum give the testimony and he's since made a film. And so there's, there's the intergenerational bit of the... Of, uh, He's also a victim in many ways, but then retelling that story as he becomes into his professional career as a filmmaker. So I don't know what's going on in that space. I think it's a really important point. Um, yeah, um, so you spoke a lot about South Africa and um, building Sanitary, the Southern Territory after the um, end of the apartheid. Um, I see a major difference between South Africa and Australia being that leadership in the Truth Commission and in Africa were. You know, the victims of apartheid were Nelson Mandela, were destined to were black men. Um, but there's not really the equivalent here in Australia. Do you really think <coughs> solidarity can happen when we don't have our sovereignty recognised in the same way as um, the rights of black South Africans were, or even just the same amount of political power um, as you know someone like Nelson Mandela did in South Africa? Um, I'm not sure I fully understood your question rightly. I wouldn't be saying that we don't have the Marcia Langtons and the Noel Pearsons and um, a pretty significant indigenous leadership. But I think if I'm answering your question, if I'm hearing your question rightly, you're talking about the people in power as in the government? Yeah, but also, um, like, <coughs> you know, uh, part of the other group saying from the heart was, you know, a recommendation that there's like a divided economy government and then some like that. And is it the place where we can Mm. Uh, I think it's a really interesting question. Uh, it's partly who's going to get the work done as a pragmatic response. I remember uh, a decade plus ago here at Melbourne, Ian Anderson said to me, I think we should start thinking about the reconciliation action plan here and you know, we're going to have to do the work. I said, Ian, that's not our job, that's their job. Uh, and his response was, yes, but they're not going to do it. So how do we trigger that and get that moving? And I think that's quite different now. They, there's a, there is a whole lot of work going on, but it's who's going to get things started. Um, uh, but I wouldn't get also caught in the trap around solidarities being any easier than reconciliation. I think it demands actually more. Uh, it demands a whole lot more in terms of recognising uh, what might need to be done. The question about economic uh, justice, for example, actually says it's not just... There's another quote there from... Uh, uh, a journalist, he says, reconciliation is not black and white going to hug each other in the street. He's talking about South Africa. Um, so I think solidarity probably demands more. Who gets it going? Um, I don't care. And, 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 I wouldn't, and I also wouldn't shape the black, good, white, bad dichotomy either. That's why you're thinking about this notion of reparative humanism. Uh, it's, it's, it's not white and black it's actually human to human. And that was very much Tutu's message through all of his life, through all of his work he did. It's actually had, and, and that, that Pumla kind of is starting to work on as a psychologist, how to see yourself in the other. And in doing that, it, it probably doesn't matter who leads lots of the solidarity work. It's actually around what that looks like and what, it, what the responses are. But lots of people don't agree with me. Sean, um, <clears throat> we could go on all night, but uh, we will have the opportunity to have some discussion at back over, over drinks. And uh, I'd like to invite Harley to, to come forward and to offer a vote of thanks for helping us all. You just wait. So, on behalf of Queen's, I'd like to thank Professor Ewan for coming tonight and giving the Indigenous oration. As most have probably heard Stuart say, Knowledge sharing has been a tradition on this land long before the castle was erected, and I personally really appreciated hearing Professor Ewan's insight on reconciliation in place. Professor Ewan's highlighted the importance of truth-telling in the reconciliation process, and I think something that is especially important in the Australian context of reconciliation is a sustained public consciousness of truth. Um, the Indigenous oration is important to Queen's as a community and was sorely missed last year. As, um, and as we learn on this, in this place and on this land, it is important to hear from its first peoples as we move to make a better future for everyone that inhabits the Australian continent. Um, so please accept this as a small token of our appreciation. 
um, for sharing your knowledge and your insight on place, reconciliation and solidarity. Thank you. Um, I would just like to thank everyone again for coming uh, this evening. And um, I, I, I keep thinking when we're told that, uh, you know, COVID is over and uh, uh, every, everything's back to the same. And then I look at the events that we hold and there are empty seats and uh, we know why there are empty seats. But um, Sean, um, once again, uh, thank you. Um, thank you for making the, the trip south. Uh, the, the weather is going to be much more miserable here than it is up okay. north, yes. but uh, yes. uh, but you're amongst friends, and uh, uh, we look forward to having a, a drink with you and uh, sh sharing again some of your ideas. Uh, I come back to that concept um, that I raised at the beginning from Murray Sinclair, and I keep coming back to this every time I, I think about this issue that the problems came with education and they'll go with education. We're in an academic centre. You, you have added so much, I think, uh, uh, to this debate in your time when you were at Melbourne, I'm sure now, uh, when you are at Griffith, in a much wider context in your role. And uh, we wish you all the best. Um, please, everyone, join us for drinks and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you.